Lulled to rest in the back of our transport by the tunes of old human music, Earth prominently featured within my dreams that night. In the most memorable of said visions, me and Vavi were enjoying a good meal together at my favorite restaurant back home. As was true with all dreams, the details grew fuzzy once it was over. For some reason, however, the memory of my Kafel friend's order was one that stuck with me. Mainly imagined because of how bizarre it was. Who the hell orders pancakes at a steakhouse? I vividly remember asking her. Before Vavi's dream iteration could answer this query, however, the sudden jolt of our transport as it came to halt roused me from my slumber. Could you please wake it up, Miss Vavi? My earpiece hummed in a deep human voice previously attributed to the soldiers. It has a name, you know. I murmured in solid zintrish, obviously not word for word perfect, but close enough to leave some of the soldiers rattled as I opened my eyes and sat up within the seat I'd fallen asleep in to toss him a glare. My name is Andrew, and I can fully understand what you're saying. Mirthful clicking resonated from the throats of a few other guards as the guilty party visibly recoiled in shock from this revelation. I will admit that my frustrations here were slightly exaggerated, as I could easily imagine myself making a similar mistake in his situation. That being said, messing with people, alien or not, was a guilty pleasure of mine, one that I happily indulged whenever the opportunity to do so without consequence presented itself. You were murmuring in your sleep. Vavi chirped softly, immediately snapping me from my false intimidation as I turned to regard her with an awkward laugh. Please tell me I didn't say anything stupid. The fact that I vaguely remembered the word cloaca showing up in there definitely did not bode well for me. You were rambling on about me and pancakes. She continued, prompting a sigh of relief from me. What is a pancake? a sugary foodstuff enjoyed often by humans for the first meal of our day. I explained, ultimately determining no further detail to be necessary, mainly because I was unsure how they would react to the idea of humans eating the eggs of non-sapient animals. Surely, given their nutrient-rich nature and the Kaffel's evolutionary history as opportunistic omnivores, such a thing would be understandable. That being said, I felt at the time like a vehicle full of armed military personnel was not the ideal place to test that hypothesis. Nevertheless, hearing what she did about my dream's contents, a mode of sadness appeared to flicker across the Kaffel biologist's demeanor as she regarded me anew with a look of concern. Yearning for the nest of Earth, she asked, Chot quickly cutting in to inform me of her metaphor's meaning, something akin to homesick. It must be rather disquieting to wake up centuries in the future and on an alien planet. Hope it's not a flight risk. I heard one of the soldiers growl under his breath. Casting a glance across from me, I discovered the source of this comment to be the same guard from before, the one who now seemed to be calling me it just to piss me off. Oh, police, I snarked, shaking my head in response to this ridiculous comment as I shot another distinctly more serious glare at the soldier, removing my mask so as to force him to look me in the eyes. Even if I somehow did desire to desert you, which I do not, where the hell would I go? Providence is as likely to take me prisoner as sacrifice me, and I still haven't figured out what caused my ship's thrusters to fail. Interrupting our brief verbal altercation with the coffle equivalent of clearing one's throat, Chot was the next among us to speak. Lieutenant Chirac, could you please stop bothering Andrew? He began absolutely demanding the soldier's compliance in all but phrasing. He has been nothing save for cooperative since landing here and is atop that priceless to our battle against Providence. Well, forgive me if I don't quite trust it. The soldier hissed sarcastically, seemingly surprising Chot with his clear violation of their evident hierarchy. Perfect solutions don't just fall out of space. How can we be so sure he's not just trying to scout for an invasion or something? Placing a claw upon my shoulder, seemingly to comfort my growing unease, Vavi met this suspicion with more verbal aggression than even I had planned to. That's ridiculous. She nearly screeched, her feathers puffing out slightly in a gesture admittedly somewhat frightening to me. If that was the case, why would he be giving us weaponry stronger than what we've already got? 
With all due respect, ma'am. The lieutenant continued, assuring us all that his continuing tirade would surely be anything but. Do you really think the weapons he's giving us would be even close to effective against a battalion of humans? What if he's helping us take down the Temenian so that once they invade, the larger force is already dealt with? Chirac, the Kafal diplomat continued angrily. If you continue antagonizing him, then I can and will be filing it as a sabotage of military property, punishable by court-martial. Property? Property. Regarding us both with a sigh, Chot clarified. Apologies, Andrew. Because our constitution does not yet legally qualify humans as people, I am simply deferring to the harshest possible punishment. If it makes you feel any better, your current status as Class 8 research equipment means that your life is technically more valuable than those of everyone else in this vehicle combined. Uh, thanks, I guess. I replied awkwardly, unsure of and frankly not optimistic about how precisely to feel about such a title. What does Class 8 mean? Equipment importance is scaled from 0 to 8. Our driver picked up, turning around to regard us from the front seat of our transport, which I now realized was, in fact, within some kind of parking garage. For perspective, the first internal combustion engine prototype was a six. And what kind of equipment is an eight? I asked in English, prompting from Chot himself, not a translation, but instead a direct response. Utterly and unequivocally world-changing. He espoused, waving his claws outward in a human-like indication of grandeur. I couldn't determine whether it was adapted from human culture or simply a matter of odd convergence. You, my friend, are the first Class 8 piece of equipment ever uncovered. Implications aside, that's pretty damn amazing, don't you think? And a mind-sniffing Kityav is a two. Chirac huffed, staring at the nearby door of our transport as though looking out a non-existent window. So congratulations, you're marginally more important than our battlefield animals. Chirac? Chot growled once more more this time in unison with Vavi and a few of the less decorated soldiers whom I presumed to be Kirak's underlings. Just stating a fact. The combative Kaffel shrugged, nonchalantly investigating his talons in complete and total disregard for the entire vehicle's worth of individuals against him. Our friend doesn't have scales, but I'm sure it's not scaleless enough to be offended by the truth. Right, Andrew? Right. I replied through gritted teeth not wanting to give this lieutenant the satisfaction of a negative response that may validate his theories of hostility. Admittedly, placing myself in his lack of shoes, I understood the suspicion. If during World War II, a living, breathing gray showed up to help fight the Axis powers no strings attached, I can imagine many humans reacting similarly. Worst of all, I was almost certain that that exact scenario was on some conspiracy board back on Earth somewhere. Maybe once everyone back home learned about real aliens, all the theories about them will die down in favor of the facts. Yeah, almost certainly not. I'm glad to see you're still smiling. Vavi chirped enthusiastically, grossly misinterpreting my gesture in a way I simply had not the heart to refute. Fortunately, before Chirac had opportunity to further infuriate me, our collective conversation was interrupted by a knocking upon the door nearest to me. Temenian's egg is rotten. A voice began from the other side, the nonsensical line seemingly the first piece of some kind of code. Strangely enough, returning the outsider's knock, our driver responded to this prompt with a similarly cryptic verse. And its fumes shall be their end. Everyone out, single file. The voice demanded, unlocking my door from the outside and swinging it open to reveal standing there a surprisingly short coffle with red scales and single-pronged ears. You first, Mr. Human. Offering up a compliant nod, I quickly reapplied my coffle mask and with careful steps exited the vehicle per the stranger's commands. Is this a joke? One of the soldiers squawked angrily, leering down at the new arrival with disdain, so clear it transcended the borders of species without even requiring a translation, though I was provided one regardless by my earpiece. Who the hell put a red scale in charge of us? The soldier spat, his usage of those two words as a single phrase rather telling. Salkum did. Chot growled, glaring down Kirok's company, as though daring another of them to speak up. 
Tag is a loyal operative recognized by the Prime Minister himself. Loyal to his next paycheck, maybe. One of the soldiers murmured loudly enough for everyone inside to hear. Control your men. Chot spat, hopping out of the vehicle after me and offering the red scale an affectionate handshake analog. Good to see you again. He then chirped, greeting this Teague as one would an old friend. Pretty great, actually. Teague replied, returning the friendly gesture. I've got to be the luckiest red scale alive. Working as a special operative under the big man, some of my folks still don't believe it. Excuse me. Curiosity briefly overwhelming my politeness, I determined my question to be one worth interrupting over. I have to ask, what's wrong with someone having red scales? Only that we're primitive, weak, greedy, and overall inferior. Meeting my question with a light huff of indignation, clearly directed away from myself, Tag began anew. At least, that what everyone says we are. I assure you, Mr. Alien, sir, we're not nearly as bad as politicians will tell you. I'm sorry to hear people think that about you. Responding to the Koffel's brief rant with nary more than a sad nod, I eventually found it in me to continue the talk. Back on Earth, things used to be pretty similar. I hope the Koffel eventually get better, like we humans did. Sorta. I guess it ain't all terrible. The Red Scale sighed, placing his claws professionally behind his back as he straightened out his posture to stand about a head shorter than me. Nobody suspects me of being an undercover agent. Usually they just assume I'm up to no good and leave it at that. I would have appreciated to know about this. I began bluntly, probing Chot for some form of reply. Those cartoons you watched contained a ton of stereotypes. I thought you would pick things up on your own. I thought the short ones were silly children. I exclaimed in reply, noting a sad, ironic giggle from Vavi in response to my newfound anguish of having laughed at racist caricatures. Regardless, Teague cooed, holding out his left claw for me to shake. It really is a pleasure to meet you, sir. Likewise, I replied, accepting his gesture with excessive enthusiasm and a careful regard for my own prior evident strength. All right, then. Chirped my Kafel translator, marching ahead alongside the red scale and gesturing for all of us to follow. Thank you for watching. Like, share, and subscribe for more original content. New chapters and standalone stories uploaded weekly.